Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Robert. I'll be your host. We're going to get started in just a few seconds. Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Robert. I'll be your host. Let's go ahead and get started. This is the Vincent Van Gogh Film Festival where we're showing the second of our three films and today or tonight, depending on what time zone you're in, we're going to be talking about and then screening at Eternity's Gate. And so thanks for joining us. We always welcome people to introduce themselves. So if you're watching on Zoom, you can let us know where you're connecting from, your first name and your favorite art related film in the Zoom chat or the Q&A. If you're watching on Facebook, you can type the same thing in the comments on Facebook. And then we don't have time if you're watching on Zoom, unfortunately to do a Zoom demonstration. But if you are watching on Zoom and you're not familiar with the application, there's usually just two things that people want to know how to do. One is how to adjust the sound. So everyone will be in listen only mode or muted except for myself. So if you're listening to this discussion or watching the film and you start cheering or singing or anything like that, don't worry. No one else will be able to hear you outside your household. If you do want to raise or lower the volume on your session, you can check the settings locally on your own device. And then the Q&A feature, if you have any questions or comments, you can feel free to type those in the chat or the Q&A feature in Zoom or in the comment section on Facebook. Um, just before I was welcoming everyone. And again, if you wanna let us know your first name, where you're connecting from and your favorite art related film as we already have to start planning ahead which film we're gonna show next. And then again, this is the Van Gogh Film Fest we're gonna be watching at Eternity's Gate. So for those of you not familiar with us, we're Washington, D.C. History and Culture. We're a nonprofit community organization. And back before COVID, um, we used to do all of these in-person programs. And my name is Robert Kellerman. I'm the founder and the director of the Washington, D.C. History and Culture Organization. And long before COVID uh, came around, we used to do all these in-person programs throughout the Washington, D.C. area. And one of the more popular ones is that we would do is we have a Van Gogh and Impressionism tour at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Of course, that's been on hold, um, but we'll start that back up at some point in time once it's safe to do so. In the meantime, uh, or actually forgot to mention this, so we, one of our in-person programs we had is we periodically would attend film screenings, and so we actually went to the opening night of At Eternity's Gate. It was playing, if you're familiar with the Washington, D.C. area, it was playing at the infamous landmark East Street Cinema on 11th Street. And so I think there was about 35 of us joined us for that. We had dinner beforehand, watched the film, and then met afterwards and talked about it. So we'll start back up doing these things again in person at some point in time, uh, but we have to wait for COVID to end first. So in the meantime, we've been doing all these live stream programs, which we'll continue doing even after COVID ends. And so we were watching these three Vincent Van Gogh films. So yesterday we saw Lust for Life. Today we're watching At Eternity's Gate. And tomorrow we're gonna to be watching Loving Vincent. And if you wanna watch the previous program from yesterday, the one from today or the one for tomorrow, not the actual film screening, but just this discussion part, you can find it along with a lot of other programs on our YouTube page. Just look for us, Washington DC History and Culture on YouTube. 
And why are we having all these Van Gogh films this week? Well, it's because it's Vincent's birthday today. So Vincent Van Gogh was born March 30th, 1853. He died at the young age of 37 on July 29th, 1890. So if you haven't had a chance to, make sure you have a piece of birthday cake in Vincent's honor because he was not appreciated as much as he should have been while he was alive. So we kind of have to uh, make up for lost time, so to speak. Okay, so if you have not joined one of our film history programs before, they really kind of have four purposes. And one of them is to view great films, including ones we either haven't seen before or haven't seen in a long time. I think this one falls into that category. Uh, number two, want to study history and popular culture through films. Number three, want to learn about the historical context of the film, its creators, and the subjects portrayed, uh, in this case, Vincent Van Gogh. And number four, discover additional historical resources like films, music, books, museums, etc cetera, etc cetera. so I'm going to talk about the film and give you a historical context of it for about I don't know 45 minutes or 50 minutes whatever um, and then if you're watching on zoom we'll stream the film and so if you're watching on zoom just sit tight after this historical program is over with we'll actually stream the whole film if you're watching on Facebook you'll have to pull up the film on your own through like YouTube or Amazon or something because you can't stream the film um, to people that are watching on YouTube because of copyright issues so that's the story with that. So let's talk about At Eternity's Gate. And just real quick, what's my personal opinion of this film? Um, well, overall, I like the movie. Um, some things that I did like about it, some aspects that I thought were positives was it provides a good overview of Vincent's final three and a half years of his life. So that's good. Uh, it gives some insight into Vincent's intellect, his philosophy of life uh, and art. And then it also goes through kind of how he actually made some of his paintings. So that was pretty cool. And then I also like the acting in it. I think a lot of the performances are very well done. Some of the things that um, concerned me was I thought it had a little bit too much emphasis on the whole mental health angle. Obviously, mental health is important for everybody, um, including Vincent Van Gogh. But I thought the film um, maybe could have lessened the amount of focus that it had on that and maybe talked about other things. And then there's <laughs> there, there's a few scenes where I'm not quite sure, even after watching this film several times, what the purpose of these particular scenes were. Maybe you might see um, what I mean. And when we, we this is the second screening we've had today. And in the earlier one, people were like, what, what is this? part of the movie all about Robert. And I'm like, you know, I'm not really sure. So you can be on the lookout for that yourself. But anyway, that's just my opinion. And I'd be curious to see what your thoughts are. Overall, I do recommend this film, which is why we're watching it. Uh, obviously wouldn't be streaming a film that I gave thumbs down to overall. But as the film is playing or when we're done, I'd really be curious to see what were your thoughts or what did you think about it? Because it's always fascinating to see what different people's perspectives are. So again, you can do that in the chat or the Q&A on Zoom or the comment section on Facebook a little bit later. So let's talk about some of the people or the players that were involved in putting this film together. The director, Julian, actually was a painter himself and then also a filmmaker. So he has the interesting perspective of he actually made art uh, in addition to film. So that kind of gave him a unique perspective. Um, he made several other films before at Eternity's Gate. Um, you might have seen some of these. Probably the most well-known are The Diving Bell and the Butterfly and Lou Reed's Berlin. Um, not sure if you've seen any of these other films. If you have, uh, let us know what you thought in the chat or the Q&A or the comments. And we'll go from there. And this is actually a picture of him standing alongside Van Gogh, one of his self-portraits, and then an artwork that the director made himself on the our right side of the screen. So you can get a sense for that. And he was a big admirer of Vincent Van Gogh, and he really felt like there wasn't a film that told the story of Vincent's life in the way that he thought it should be told, and though he thus he ends up putting the film together. So that's pretty cool that he was inspired to do so. Now, the title of the film, At Eternity's Gate, is based off of the title of a painting that Vincent made. The painting is on the right. It was Vincent um, created this painting while he was in a mental health hospital, and it was actually very similar to a drawing that he had made um, much earlier in his life. Uh, so there you can see At Eternity's Gate is a title of a Van Gogh painting. We'll talk a little bit more about the title a little bit later. And during his lifetime, Vincent made 36 
self-portraits. You might have seen this matrix before if you've been on one of our programs. I put this together so people could see all of the Van Gogh self-portraits all at one time. How this works is Vincent painted the one on the top left first and the one on the bottom right last and the other ones in sequential order. And in particular, I want you to focus on the two that are kind of in the middle on the bottom row that have the red box around them. And the reason being is because those two self-portraits were really kind of the basis for the marketing materials and whatnot that the film's creators put together. So you can see um, that Vincent Van Gogh, this is timing of this is easy to determine because he has a bandage wrapped around his head because he made the self-portraits shortly after he had his ear uh, incident and thus the bandage around his head. You can see in the film uh, mock-up, they have Willem Dafoe. He's also got a bandage around his head and a similar type of hat and jacket. Um, so if you're wondering where this originated from, it's kind of sort of like how yesterday, if you were with us when we were talking about Lust for Life, their kind of approach centered on the uh, Van Gogh self-portrait at the Detroit Institute of Arts. And then the one for tomorrow, Loving Vincent, that also focuses on a self-portrait. We have to come back then to learn more about that. And here's the close-up. Okay, so sometimes when people watch films, they really just kind of focus on the actors and actresses, or maybe the director, um, not so much some of the other people that were involved, but I really like the cinematography in this film. It's really well done. And you may be familiar with this gentleman. He is a pretty well-known cinematographer. He's been done a work on a lot of um, important and really good films. Probably his most famous work outside of this one is he was the cinematographer for Boy in the Striped Pajamas, if you've seen that film before. And kind of when you're watching um, films that are created by the same uh, person or persons, kind of look for similarities and contrast. So here's a famous scene or important scene where boys running through the woods. And it kind of reminded me of this scene there, Vincent's in the field with his arms uh, extended out. So there's some comparisons and some contrast there. Okay, let's talk about Willem Dafoe. He was the actor who played Vincent Van Gogh. And Willem had big shoes to fill because previously uh, Vincent Van Gogh was played by the late great Kirk Douglas. Uh, and so the, this icon of the golden era of Hollywood and his rendition of Vincent Van Gogh was extremely well received both with the public and with critics. He was nominated for an Academy Award um, and it is, really did a great job. Uh, it's really one of the strengths of the film yesterday was Kirk Douglas's performance. It was really fascinating reading the comments from people that as they were watching the film there were a lot of younger people like in their 20s and 30s that said things like oh you know um, I never I've heard of Kirk Douglas but I've never actually seen his film he's actually a really good actor or people saying that they forgot um, how good he was or they had only seen him in um, you know Spartacus or whatnot. So a really powerful performance. That's what William Defoe is following in on. And he was um, up to the task. He did a great job himself as we're playing the film. And if you did see the one yesterday, um, you can kind of compare and contrast their two styles and approaches. And here is Mr. Defoe. He, um, very well-known actor, very prolific. Um, probably the films that he's most known for is Platoon, uh, The Last Temptation of Christ, quite a few other ones. He actually received an Academy Award nomination for his performance in his films. So that's pretty cool. One of the things with him that people got hung up on the film is the age difference. So when this film was being produced, uh, Willem was 62 years old and Vincent Van Gogh died when he was 37. So there's that 25 year age difference. So some people really got hung up on that. Um, I did notice it, but I tried to just kind of forget about it. So if you're like a, a purist or whatnot, historically, that might bother you. But suffice to say, I did think he did a great job. I um, just want to point that out that some people get kind of hung up on the whole age thing. Um, let's see, he was famously in Platoon, came out in 1986. And if you saw Platoon, one of the famous scenes towards the very end is when William's character is killed. Um, and this is the scene of him getting shot and he raises his arms kind of up. <laughs> and there's a scene very reminiscent of that in At Eternity's Gate. And so again, it's kind of funny when uh, different people are involved in different films to kind of look for things that might be similar. So the scene on top 
which is not when Van Gogh is getting shot, by the way, um, is just very similar in my mind um, to the platoon scene. So maybe a little bit of a homage there. And the film that I really liked Willem Dafoe in was with Mississippi Burning with him and Gene Hackman playing FBI agents that go down to Mississippi to investigate the murder of three civil rights workers. So if you've never seen this film before, it's really awesome. I was actually thinking about maybe streaming this at some point in time because it's a really uh, excellent film. It's based on a, some true events. And so, so maybe at some point in time, we can check that one out. And Willem is a big Vincent Van Gogh fan. So here he is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, uh, checking out the self-portrait and some other things. So that's pretty cool. So you have the filmmaker, the director is a big fan of Vincent Van Gogh. And then you have the actor playing Vincent is also a fan of his. So that's nice. And one of the things that I liked about this film is it really gives you a sense of the intellect of Vincent Van Gogh, more so than the one that we saw yesterday or perhaps some of the other films. So for instance, in this particular scene, uh, Vincent or Willem is at the Louvre checking out art. And Vincent spent a lot of his lifetime uh, his adult life, really studying art and other artists and trying to figure out what um, he liked and didn't like about him, spent a lot of time visiting art galleries and reading books about art and visiting museums, and they, and they have depictions of that in the film, and so I like that aspect of it. This particular scene was based on yet another Van Gogh self-portrait. You can see the self-portrait on the right and the costume on the left. It's funny when these filmmakers, if they're um, trying to be historically accurate, uh, they'll look for images from the past and try and line them up. So you can see they did a pretty good job on this one. And then here he is at the Louvre. And so again, um, I think some people maybe have the impression of Vincent is kind of this crazy country bumpkin kind of guy. Um, and, you know, he wasn't without his challenges, but he was, again, he was very, um, he didn't have like a college degree, but he was really well read. He was very intelligent, spent a lot of time studying uh, different art forms. And so I like the fact that they captured that. He also was a big fan of Shakespeare. Um, and so here's a quote from Vincent where he says, my God, how beautiful Shakespeare is. Who else is as mysterious as he is? His language and method are like a brush trembling with ecstasy, but one must learn to read just as one must learn to see and learn to live. And so there's a scene in the film where, um, the Van Gogh character was actually talking about Shakespeare, which you normally wouldn't think that they would include that uh, in something like this. So I thought it was a really nice touch to give you a sense of his intelligence and the fact that he was really interested um, in a lot of other like art forms and things going on. So you can be on the lookout for that. He basically has a discussion with a young woman about Shakespeare, so that's pretty cool. Um, some of the scenes, when you watch a film about a historical topic, some of the scenes you might watch and be like, hey, did that really happen? Or you know, did that really take place? And so like, for instance, um, they show the process of Vincent making some of his artwork. And there's one particular scene where he's painting a pair of shoes. So there's the shoes and there's Vincent creating the artwork. And some of the, the artwork that's included in the film is not real Van Gogh paintings. These were for the most part made by the director himself and then with Willem Dafoe helping out a little bit here and there. Um, so that painting that you're seeing in this screenshot is not an exact Van Gogh painting. It's a mock-up basically, just to give you a sense of uh, what it was like. But this actual event though took place. Vincent actually did spend time making paintings of his shoes um, and drawings of his shoes. So here's some examples for you. So when you see this taking place uh, and you're wondering like, God, why would he include this in the film? Well, that actually was something that Vincent did. He was really proud of the fact that he walked a lot um, and to him shoes like this and the fact that they were worn were kind of like a um, connection that he had to the working class and people uh, you know, that did manual labor and were on their feet all day and stuff like that. If you're in the Baltimore, Maryland area, um, probably the most famous painting of shoes is there. Uh, it was done in 1887. And so again, when you see this clip in the film, you can know that that's not really like a made up thing that actually happened. 
And another thing that I liked about this film is it showed the painting process, how Vincent actually made some of his paintings, including painting outdoors, which um, may not seem like that big of a deal now, but in the time of the Impressionist, that was something different. Prior to Impressionism or prior to like say the 1860s and 1870s, artists almost always made their paintings indoors in a studio. So for instance, this picture on the left is a Rembrandt painting of his studio. Um, and then over on the right, uh, there's a gentleman and he's painting a landscape scene, but he's doing it indoors in a studio. So up until the 18, say 70s, if you were painting, you would always do it inside in a studio indoors. Even if you were doing an outdoor scene, you would just make the sketches and the drawings on a preliminary basis outside. And then you would come back indoors and make the actual painting or the oil painting in so indoors. Um, so that's what happened before Impressions. But then Monet and Renoir and others come along and Van Gogh and they start painting outdoors. And again, that made seem kind of, um, I don't know, obvious to us now, but that was a big shift for artists of this era. And so there's a pretty well-known painting that Van Gogh made on the left, which is called The Artist on His Way to Work. And so what Vincent would do is he would get up in the morning, he'd pack up all of his stuff, his paints, his brushes, his palette, the canvas, and uh, probably a snack for lunch. And he goes roaming around the countryside looking for stuff to paint. And when he finds a scene that captures his attention, he'd set up shop, so to speak, um, and go to work. Now, the painting on the left actually no longer exists. Unfortunately, it was destroyed during World War II. This is a copy of it because they had black and white photos of it. And so different artists have kind of recreated what they think um, it would look like. So this particular image on the left, it's not the exact Van Gogh painting that he created, but it's an interesting one because it shows him kind of roaming around the countryside looking for stuff to paint. And again, he titled it uh, The Artist on His Way to Work. The picture on the right um, basically shows the film character kind of doing the same thing, roaming around the countryside with his stuff. Here's the painting. Here's Willem Dafoe. So again, get up in the morning, pack up all your stuff, roam around the countryside, and look for something interesting to paint. And then when he finds it, sets up shot. So if he sees a scene like this, oh, okay, yeah, this looks really cool. I think I'll make a painting of this. That's what he would end up doing. Again, that might be kind of um, not as profound now in 2021 because we're used to people doing stuff. But in the era of the Impressionist, this was something very, very different. And <laughs> one of the things I liked also about the film is it had um, Vincent being happy in quite a few scenes, like in this particular scene, he's basically happy to be uh, outdoors and whatnot. And again, a lot of the focus on his life is kind of the gloom and doom, uh, negative mental health stuff, which obviously is plays a part in his life. But um, if you read Vincent's letters or study him, he was really um, oftentimes excited about the fact that he was really pursuing his passion or his life's calling to be an artist. Um, now, granted, he had some ups and downs, including quite a few downs, um, but frequently in his letters, he would talk about the fact that how proud he was or how happy he was that he was a painter. And that's what, you know, that's what he wanted to do. And that's what he was being um, able to do as opposed to being in um, some type of job that he didn't necessarily like. And then again, here he is setting up outside painting. Uh, just once again, these paintings that are shown in the film are just kind of mock-ups. So this is not an exact Van Gogh painting in the film, but just to kind of give you a sense of what the painting process was like. So again, that change between making paintings indoors in a studio and then painting outside in plain air. Okay, so the film focuses on the last three and a half years of Vincent van Gogh's life, which he spent in France. Vincent was initially born and raised in the Netherlands, and he does spend the last few years of his life in France. The film focuses on the last three and a half years of his 37 year life. And for the first part of that time, he's in Paris in the film. Uh, he ended up spending two years in Paris, but the film only shows that for just a few, a little bit. Uh, most of the film is centered around the time that Vincent was in the south of France. He would spend 27 months there, and then he would go back up to the north of France and live the final 10 weeks of his life there. The reason why usually 
films and biographies and articles and whatnot about Vincent focus on this South of France period, as does the Lust for Life films, because this is the time when he makes most of his iconic paintings. Um, so these are six examples of paintings that Vincent made while he was living in the South of France. And if you had to rank like, I don't know, the top 25 most well-known Van Gogh paintings, like 90% of them would have been made during this South of France time. It's really considered like kind of the high point of his career as a painter. Now, as his personal life was going on, uh, it was filled with a lot of tragedy uh, and whatnot. But as far as painting output goes, most of his well-known paintings he made in the South of France. So that's why films and stuff like that focus on this point in time in his life. But before he gets to the South of France, he arrives in Paris. And the reason why he moves to Paris is twofold. Number one, his brother Theo is living there. Theo is his younger brother, three years younger. He was living in Paris. He was the manager of an art gallery. So he was an art dealer. He was pretty successful. Um, he supports Vincent both emotionally and financially throughout Vincent's um, last many years of his life. So Vincent's receiving uh, financial support from his brother Theo. So that allowed Vincent the opportunity to focus uh, his attention full time on painting. And in the film, Vincent's brother Theo is very nicely played by Rupert Friend. We'll talk more about him in a minute. Uh, the other reason why Vincent moves to Paris is because it's the center of the art world and Vincent wants to be a professional painter. So it makes sense that you would go to Paris. That's where all the action uh, is taking place, so to speak. This photo does not have Vincent Van Gogh in it, but it's a salon, uh, basically showing you different artists of this era coming together and getting to know one another. And while he's in Paris, he meets Paul Gauguin and you'll see that depicted in the film. So here's where they are at. So Paris plays a really important role in Vincent's life. This numerous things happened to him the two years they were there, including meeting Paul. So let's talk about Paul. He's very well played in the film by Oscar Isaac. And he also had big shoes to fill because in the Lust for Life film that came out, uh, let's see, 32 years prior, uh, Paul Gauguin was played by Anthony Quinn and he was very well received both by the public and by critics. In fact, Anthony Quinn won an Academy Award for his portrayal of Paul Gauguin. So when Oscar Isaac steps into the role. Uh, those are the shoes that he's filling. And in my opinion, he really did a great job as well. Uh, they actually had him kind of looking very similar to Paul Gauguin. That's a portrait that Paul made uh, of himself on the left. And there's the film character on the right. And I also think they did a great job with the costume. Uh, he looks very, uh, I don't know, dapper and uh, he's got a very cool style about him. I'll say that he looks very avant-garde. Um, so here's another picture of him in the film. And here's again, Vincent meets him in Paris, although most of the time in the film that when they're together, they're in the south of France. So just to make sure you have that distinction. And so they meet and start talking. And when they met initially in Paris, they weren't best friends or anything. Uh, they were just kind of more of like acquaintances. Um, it's not till they end up sharing a place together down south where they really start to get to know uh, one another better. So Vincent leaves Paris, moves to the south of France. He invites Paul to come down there with him. Uh, Paul uh, eventually ends up doing so. And then a lot of the film is kind of centered around their relationship. They're hanging out together, um, both you know drinking and eating and then also making art. So as you watch the film, if you saw the one yesterday, you'll have to kind of compare and contrast the Paul Gauguin um, uh, depictions by these two artists and see uh, how they're similar yet different. Now, Paul would eventually later on in life become a very well-known artist. In fact, he's one of the icons of the Impressionist or Post-Impressionist movement. Here's a self-portrait that he made. His most well-known works uh, are created in the time period after he's depicted in the film. Later on in life, he would move to Tahiti and he would make a lot of paintings like this. And again, he ends up um, now, he's one of the most famous artists of his generation and in history. Um, but the time when he's depicted in the film, he's a starving artist just like Vincent is that hardly anyone has ever heard of. Now let's do this. Um, since Paul is depicted in the film, let's take a talk a little bit more about Paul and his artwork and compare it to Vincent and his artwork. So here's two portraits. One's done by Paul, one's done by Vincent. 
Which one do you like better? Hmm, what do you think? Well, Vincent painted the one on the left of his friend Paul, and Paul painted the one on the right of his friend Vincent. And when you look at their kind of paintings side by side, you can kind of see some similarities and some differences between the two. Here is Vincent's depiction of Paul and Paul's depiction of Vincent. Now, interestingly enough, a couple of the paintings that Paul made while he was in the south of France living with Vincent are two of his most well-known works. <laughs> so it is um, noteworthy that he ends up going down there and spending time. So this is one of um, Paul's most well-known works, partially because uh, it's a depiction of Vincent van Gogh. But suffice to say, he would not have made this painting if he had not been invited down to the south of France. And Vincent van Gogh, is, one of the things that he's most well known for is his sunflower paintings. And those have a really fascinating connection to Paul Gauguin. So when Paul paints Vincent, just ironically enough, of all the 1,000 paintings that Vincent made that he could have depicted him uh, creating in the painting that he made of him, he just so happens to make him creating the sunflowers, which again is like one of his most iconic series of paintings is Van Gogh's self flowers. And so interestingly enough, uh, that's what Paul chose to depict Vincent creating when he made this portrait of him. So that's pretty cool. The other thing that's really amazing is when Vincent was living in the south of France, the place where he's at was um, not very fancy and the walls were bare and so he decides to decorate the walls of these this um, two-room boarding house with some of his artwork so that number one he can show it to Paul so Paul can see what it's like but also to decorate the place and what does he decide to decorate the walls with the sunflowers so um, the sunflowers were partially created um, because um, Vincent knew that Paul was coming down to stay with him so these two kind of have an interesting connection on this sunflowers painting and here's the two side by side again. Now here's another one. Which one of these paintings do you like better? Do you like the one on the left or do you like the one on the right? Hmm, what do you think? I'll let you study those for just a second. Okay. So the Vincent van Gogh version is on the left and the Paul Gauguin version is on the right. And if you've seen the Night Cafe painting, um, that's actually the same kind of topic. So what happens is Paul and Vincent both end up painting this young lady or depicting her through art. And then later on, Paul decides to make a, basically decides to include in the painting this night cafe. Now, Vincent also painted the night cafe, but he did not include her in it. Uh, he basically makes it a separate painting, but you can see it's the same um, type of, it's the same place because notice the pool table and then in the background, the walls were red. So the night cafe was a place that was open all night and people would go there to um, have a good time, to get drunk, to crash out if they didn't have anywhere else to go uh, basically. And so that's why it's depicted here in these two paintings. Here is Vincent's version. Paul's version, which again, this also would become one of his most well-known paintings. So interestingly enough, he made it while he had uh, living with Vincent after receiving his invitation. And then Vincent's version. And the side-by-side. -side. All of them have very bright, vibrant colors. And why is this important? Well, because it's depicted in the films. So here's Paul, and he decides to paint this young lady. Now, first, he actually ended up making a drawing, but here he is depicting her in the film. So first he made, Paul made the drawing on the left, and that's actually what's depicted in the film. Then later on, subsequently, he ended up making a painting of it. And then Vincent sees this taking place like, oh, look, my buddy Paul is uh, doing this woman's portrait. Maybe I should jump in and do the same thing. So here's the two side by side, the film clip with his drawing. You can see the similarities. And then with the painting.
And then Vincent sees this taking place and like, oh, you know, I need to get in on this. I think I'll do a depiction of her as well. And so he does. There's um, a recreation of Vincent's painting of the postman in the back wall. And Vincent would end up doing six different versions of his depiction of her in kind of two different styles or two different angles, I guess you could say. And why are these people important? Well, this woman and her husband, well, that's her husband on the right that Vincent also painted, they're the owner of the night cafe. And so the night cafe, the outside is on the left and the inside is on the right. So these are two of Vincent's most iconic paintings. Uh, this is the night cafe and they're owned, or that establishment was owned by these two individuals. So they have a very important relationship in the scheme of things in terms of Vincent's life. And here's his depiction of her. That's Vincent's depiction with the woman in the film. Here's one more comparison. Which one of these do you like best? This is the postman's wife. Vincent did the one on the left and Paul did the one on the right. So again, interesting looking at these side by side, you can see some similarities between their artwork, but you can also see some differences and see um, similarities and differences would also be an effect in their relationship with one another. So here's Vincent's paintings that we saw. Here's Paul's. And eventually they're philosophies really clash. So Paul and Vincent have very different uh, demeanors. They're both very strong-willed. They're both under a lot of stress because they're living in this really cramped space and they're both starving artists that don't have any money. Um, and their art philosophies are very, very different. And so this starts to come to a head as time goes by. And Vincent actually writes a letter to his brother, Theo, where he says, Gogon has become rather disheartened with the good town of Arl, that's where they were living at the time, with the little yellow house where we work and where they were also living, and especially with me. Um, so you can see the uh, strain on the relationship. And so they end up getting in a big argument or a series of arguments. And then finally, Paul is fed up with Vincent and the south of France, and he announces that he's moving uh, back up to Paris. And so this really upsets Vincent because when he Vincent moved to the south of France. He didn't know anyone there. He had no family there, no friends. Um, he was never in a romantic relationship with anybody when he was in the south of France. Um, really, his only friend was like the postman guy. <laughs> um, and so when Paul comes down, he's really happy because he has someone to hang out with. But when Paul announces he's leaving, now Vincent's really upset and heartbroken. He's like, oh, God, I'm going to be really lonely here again. And so they get in this big fight. Uh, and then Paul announces he's leaving. And then Vincent ends up having the infamous ear incident. Let's talk about some of the acquaintances that Vincent knew, the people that you're going to meet in the film. So here's a question for you. Do you like this painting? Hmm, what do you think? Do you like this one or not? I'll tell you why I'm asking you in just a second. It's actually a the doctor that treated Vincent in his ear. Um, so he's depicted in the film. That's the image on the right. So you can be on the lookout for this gentleman. And it's a real person. There's a photo of him a little bit later in life. Um, the photograph of the doctor that treated Vincent Van Gogh is depicted on the right. And he actually made this report of Vincent's ear incident. His name was Dr. Felix Ray. He made this report many, many years later. And the reason I asked you if you liked the painting is because the doctor did not like Vincent's painting that he made of him. He said, quote, when I saw that he outlined my head entirely in green, he had only two main colors, red and green, that he painted my hair and my mustache, I really did not have red hair in a blazing red on a biting green background. I was simply horrified. <laughs> so you might look at this painting and think it's you know nice or not really all that profound, but for the people that weren't familiar with modern art or what would become modern art, this was really shocking. This is not how people made portraits uh, back then. So just the coloring and the fact that the reds in his hair, he did not have any red hair, uh, but Vincent includes that. So he was 
not happy with this portrait, even though him and Vincent got along really well. He actually really liked Vincent and was very um, um, supportive of him and was doing all he could to help him. But when it came to this painting, he did not like it. So I thought that was kind of a funny quote um, that he did not. And not only did the, the another funny part of the story is Vincent gave the painting to the doctor, tried to give it to him. And the doctor initially wouldn't accept it. He was like, oh, um, uh, no, you know, that's okay. Um, <laughs> you don't have to do that. So he was kind of reluctant to accept it, but then eventually he did. And he took it home and showed it to his mom. And his mom hated it more than he did. <laughs> so <laughs> it wasn't just him. Uh, also, his mom did not like the painting, but he's been immortalized by Vincent Van Gogh. So kind of interesting in that regard. And again, you see him in the film. And Vincent has a lot of interesting discussion, or not a lot, but he has a fair number of interesting discussions with him in the film. Uh, there's a quote that is not an exact quote from Vincent Van Gogh. Uh, it's pretty profound, but it does kind of summarize Vincent's approach um, or kind of philosophy on art. He says in the film, there's something inside me. I don't know what it is. What I see, nobody else sees. And sometimes it frightens me. I think I'm losing my mind. But then I say to myself, I'll show what I can see to my human brothers who can't see it. So again, that's not an exact Vincent Van Gogh quote that was included for the film, but it does really do um, kind of a summation of what Vincent's kind of philosophy was on some of his thoughts. He really did kind of uh, believe that he saw the world differently from other people and wanted to show them what he could see. Now, after the ear situation, Vincent um, ends up going to a mental hospital where he would live for a year. This hospital is still in existence today. It's in the south of France, and you can actually visit it um, if you so choose. Here's a sculpture of Vincent outside the facility. Most of the facility um, is still in use and is closed to the public so that people don't go in here and bother the um, patients that are getting treatment. However, they've configured it so that you can go inside and see where Vincent was staying at, at this hospital. Again, he spent about a year here. This is where he painted the famous Starry Night painting. And this is his room. So again, you can see this if you're ever in the south of France. It's you know, kind of a mini museum. And what people, when they go visit there, they're usually shocked by these heavy iron bars that are on the window. So you, once you got into this establishment, you weren't allowed to leave unless you had the permission from um, the staff. And so Vincent uh, initially does not have permission to leave. And so the painting Starry Night, um, Vincent actually made from this room while he was looking out the window one night. So pretty incredible um, story there. They don't talk about that in the film though, but they do have a character in the film who's based on a real person. There's a uh, minister who basically is um, talking to Vincent, trying to help him. And this character in the film is also based on a real person. Uh, Vincent actually did befriend uh, the minister that was responsible for this hospital and got to know him on uh, a regular basis. Unfortunately, there's no depictions of him that I know of. So we'll just go with the film one for now. Um, and again, they have some interesting dialogue with him. So this is also, I don't believe an exact quote from Vincent, but it does again kind of paraphrase some of his thoughts. Um, he's talking about the fact that he's making all these paintings, but no one's buying them. Um, and so Vincent's kind of thought later in life was that, you know, maybe he was just born too early. Uh, maybe he was given this vision to create this art for people in the future, um, which is why no one would buy the art during his lifetime. Maybe at some point in time in the future, people would be interested in his art, which is actually is what <laughs> exactly ends up happening. Um, and so there's a scene where he's talking to the minister and he says, maybe God made me a painter for people who aren't born yet. So that's kind of profound. And Vincent later on in his life, uh, kind of like the final, say, year or two, he becomes much more uh, fatalistic and much more kind of thinking about what his relationship is with eternity, and thus the name At Eternity's Gate. Vincent basically talks about in the film, the character does, um, how he's thinking about his relationship with eternity. So that was an interesting touch. So here's a trivia question for you. What do you think the record price paid for a Van Gogh painting is? What do you think? Was it a million dollars or $10 million or $50 billion. What do you think the record price was for a Van Gogh painting? I'll give you a hint. The painting is on the left. So what would you pay for that if you had money? And the answer is 
82 and a half million dollars is the record price. So how about that? So uh, that's pretty amazing. That's the record price ever paid for a Vincent Van Gogh painting. So, you know, if you're kind of at home thinking that you'd like some Van Goghs on the walls of your house and wondering what it would take, well, the price is usually vary a lot from painting to painting and time to time, but 82 and a half million is the record. So if you got that amount together, that might be a good start. Um, this painting is owned by a private individual, the one on the left that was purchased by a gentleman in Japan. Um, however, there's a similar version of it at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. Um, so this is a well-known painting. It's of the doctor who treated Vincent the last 10 weeks that he was alive. So this is back up in the north of France. And here's the doctor in the film. So when you see this, that's what's going on. And here's a picture of him, a photograph of him. So if only Vincent had gotten that $82.5 million when he was still alive, maybe he could have been all set. Um, and let's talk about Vincent's brother, Theo. Again, he's three years younger. He's living in Paris. He's a manager of an art gallery or he's an art dealer. And he's not a millionaire, but he's doing pretty well for himself. And he has enough, enough excess money to be able to send some to Vincent. Now he can't send him a lot. Uh, the good news is that Theo is able to send Vincent some money on a regular basis. The bad news is he's not able to send him a lot. So Vincent throughout his lifetime, the last many years of his life, he has to live extremely frugally because this is only money that he has coming in. So he provides a lot of um, financial and then also emotional support to Vincent. And I really liked how um, the character was portrayed in the film. So when you see this gentleman emerge, that you know who that is. Carol brings up a good point that Dr. Gachet was very controversial. Yes, he was. Uh, we're actually going to talk about that a little bit more tomorrow um, because of his role in the Loving Vincent film. Um, and again, I really liked his depiction of Theo. Now, Theo and Vincent looked somewhat similar to one another, which you can kind of get a sense of in this series of film clips. So that's the Vincent Van Gogh character on the left and the Theo Van Gogh character on the right. If you go back to the portrait, um, for the longest time, people actually thought that painting on the left that Vincent made was of himself, but the Van Gogh Museum did more study on it and they've come to the conclusion that it's much more likely to be Vincent's brother, Theo. But that being said, um, you can see like, oh, wow, yeah, that does kind of look very much like him. So. They were very close in resemblance. So some very touching scenes. Let's talk about Vincent's death and then we'll stream the film. So again, Vincent's roaming around the countryside looking for interesting things to paint. One day he's out painting and he comes home to the boarding house where he's staying in. This is actually the room or the building where Vincent Van Gogh died and it was a boarding house and a restaurant. And he goes upstairs into his room with a gunshot wound and they notify Dr. Gachet and Vincent's brother um, and they come to his room. When you go to the site now, you go up the stairs on the top floor and that doorway on the left is, was Vincent's room in the boarding house. And the picture on the right is what it looks like in more recent times. Uh, here's a historical photo, kind of gives you a sense of what it would have looked like when Vincent was. So just a really small room. Um, it's a boarding house. Again, Vincent doesn't have a lot of money, so he has to live very frugally. But this is the room where Vincent Van Gogh died in. Uh, back in 1890, so or the building that Vincent Van Gogh died in. So you can go visit this site today. It's open as a, uh, the restaurant downstairs is still open. The top floor is like a mini museum. Vincent is buried in a cemetery not far from where he died at, and that's his grave site in the center on the left. Interestingly enough, his brother Theo died six months after Vincent did. He had a number of health problems himself, Theo did. And Vincent, born in 1853, died 1890 at the young age of 37. It's interesting to think what could have happened to Vincent had he lived longer to like 50 or 60 or 70. Monet and Renoir uh, lived very long lives. If Vincent would have lived a long time, it's interesting to think how many more great paintings he could have made up, but he does die tragically at the age of 37. Now, one thing um, to point out, the film, this film and the one tomorrow, Loving Vincent, are a little bit controversial because of the ending. The Van Gogh Museum and most people surmise that Vincent killed himself by suicide. However, this film and The One Tomorrow uh, take the other view that Vincent was accidentally killed by these kids that were in the neighborhood and he just basically took the fall for it, so to speak. Um, 
that's controversial. Not everyone thinks that way. Some people do, some people do, and some people don't. Again, the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, they're like the world's leading authority on Vincent's life. They, their opinion is that Vincent died by his own hand through a gunshot wound, suicide. Um, this film and the one tomorrow, oh, and then also the, um, the Lust for Life film also took that approach. This one and the one tomorrow take the approach that Vincent was shot by these neighborhood kids. And so um, that's a really controversial subject. Um, people almost always on our tours ask me what I think. And, you know, I don't know when you hear the kind of evidence of why people think Vincent um, might have shot himself, it's very convincing. But yet, on the other hand, when you hear the evidence that people think that it was these other people, that actually sounds kind of convincing too. So I guess for myself, um, I could see either thing plausible. To me, I really don't get hung up on that part of the story just because to me, the most important thing is tragically Vincent died at a very young age. My concern though with it is that there's a big stigma um, around people that take their life through suicide and that's largely been attached to Vincent. People will say things like, well, yeah, obviously he was crazy. He cut his ear off and shot himself. Well, I don't know, who knows? Um, so anyway, I just wanted to give you that context so that when you're watching the film, um, that was open to debate. So let you decide for yourself what you think. Um, again, there's where they're buried. So again, just kind of overview my thoughts of the film. Um, I like the fact that it gives an overview of Vincent's final three and a half years of his life and that provides insight into his time in France, his uh, intellect and his art philosophy. I like the acting performances. Um, I was concerned with that, just thought it was a little bit too heavy on the mental health aspect of things. And then I'm not sure again, what some of the purpose of the few of the scenes were, but overall, I really recommend the film. I liked a lot. I'm really curious to see what you think. So as you're watching it, or when you get done watching it, feel free to share your comments in either the chat or the um, Q and A. So let's go ahead and stream the film. And again, um, tomorrow we're gonna be doing the same type of thing for Loving Vincent. And if you didn't get a chance to do, see the program we did for Lust for Life, I'll say, I have the recording of the historical part of it. I'll put it on our YouTube page, but it probably won't be um, for a couple of days. So there's a story with that. Um, you can check out our YouTube page, Washington DC History and Culture is the name of our organization. And let's see. So if you're watching on Facebook now, um, if you're watching on Zoom, just sit tight and I'm going to stream the film in just a few minutes. If you're watching on Facebook, unfortunately, I have to disconnect you because I can't stream a film on Facebook that I don't own. That's against all kinds of copyright issues. You can stream it on Zoom without any problem, but you can't stream it on Facebook. So I have to unfortunately disconnect all of our friends joining us on Facebook, but thanks for being here. Hold on one second. So thanks everyone on Facebook. We'll see you a little bit later or hopefully next time. If you want to watch, if you're on Facebook and you want to watch the loving um, Vincent film with us, actually watch the film, you have to sign up um, through Eventbrite or Meetup so you can do so via Zoom.